Uh, good evening. Uh, really excited to be here. Like Xander said, uh, my name is Max Munchenbaum, and I was invited here to talk a bit about my company, Castle. Castle is sort of a hybrid between a tech startup and a property management company. We manage rental properties, and we use technology, automation, and on-demand labor to try to rethink what the experience of not just uh, owning, but also living in rental property can look like. And I was asked to talk about how we're doing something unique by combining uh, some of the values and ethos of the technology industry with the real estate space. And so as I was writing this talk, I started to think about, OK, well, what exactly is the technology industry? And the more I thought about it, the more I realized that in 2017, that distinction between the tech and non-tech industry, uh, between the old and new way of doing things, that distinction doesn't even really make sense anymore. And, and so that's kind of what I want to talk about today. It starts with this. There's no such thing as the technology industry anymore. These three startups were some of the biggest acquisitions of 2016. Uh, every one of these guys sold for over a billion dollars. Um, but what's really interesting about these companies is that none of them made an app or a gadget or a website or any of the other things that you would traditionally associate with the technology industry. What's also really interesting is that none of these companies were acquired by an acquirer that you would traditionally think of as being in the technology space. Uh, they're bought by GM, Unilever, uh, Unilever Walmart. Um, and in fact, uh, that trend in 2016 of non-tech companies making the most startup acquisitions uh, is expected to continue basically from this point forever. Um, you know, the dream used to be that you would sell your app startup to Google for a billion dollars. Now the dream is that you sell your consumer goods startup to Procter & Gamble. There we go. Uh, even in the technology world, this was one of the biggest stories of 2016. Amazon.com, a, a company that's so tech industry, they literally have .com in their name, opened a chain of physical stores. Um, but they did this because Amazon, like all these other companies, recognizes that you know, in this new world, as technology seeps into more and more parts of our lives, the distinction between what is and isn't a tech company is increasingly meaningless. Every company is a tech company now, and that includes all the companies in this room. Your company is now a tech company, whether you like it or not. At this point, though, you're probably wondering kind of who I am and why I'm telling you all this. So I'd like to take a step back and give you a little bit more background about me and kind of how I ended up on this stage. So this is a picture of me and my co-founders uh, back in 2013 in the abandoned mansion that we bought in Detroit for $8,000. We bought this property on a whim, just like we moved to Detroit as, uh, on a whim. You know, we knew absolutely nothing about real estate, but uh, we dove in, watched all every YouTube video we could find, uh, spent nights and weekends fixing up the house, and eventually we started renting it out to other young people. Starting a company when we did this was not part of the plan, but as we got more and more involved in the rental community, we kept hearing the same problems over and over. You know, as popular as real estate investing is, owning a rental property or a portfolio of rental properties is still a big pain. Being a landlord is obviously not anyone's idea of a really fun or exciting job, but, you know, the alternative is property management. And as everyone here knows, you know, we don't exactly work in the most beloved industry. So hearing these people, all everyone we knew, just complain about these same problems over and over, inspired us to try to take a different approach with Castle. Started the company in 2015, uh, pretty quickly became Michigan's fastest growing management company, adding 650 units in just under two years. And last year, we raised an investment round of $2 million from some of the country's leading investors to try to scale the Castle model nationally. Now, when we started the company, almost everyone we know told us that we wouldn't succeed. I remember this really vividly. This is a quote I remember so vividly. Uh, someone said to me, we figured you'd putter around for a few months without getting any customers or investors and then promptly fail. Uh, the embarrassing part is this quote was actually from my own mom. Um, but, you know, we, we didn't fail. And while we're not a success yet by any means, I mean, we could still fail tomorrow. And, uh, you know, I can't emphasize enough that, that we have a ton to learn. And I, I don't want to stand up here acting like, you know, we know everything. We certainly don't. But... I think we were right to recognize that there's a real opportunity in this industry. And that's the opportunity that everyone here has recognized as well. And it's the opportunity that I want to talk about today. I'm going to show you another quote, and I promise this one is not from anyone in my family. If I hear about a business that's so boring I want to put a gun in my mouth, I smell money. 
Uh, this is a quote from a guy named Scott Galloway. He's a professor of business at NYU and one of my favorite business analysts. I highly recommend checking out his YouTube channel uh, after the conference. Um, but he's right. You know, I've always believed that if you want to find the best opportunities, you have to look where other people aren't looking. That's why I moved to Detroit, and it's why I started this company. Because the sexy industries are oversaturated, right? Everyone's already there. And what could be less sexy than property management? <laughs> In Detroit, thank you. <laughs> Very true. But property management is unsexy to the tune of being a $35 billion a year market. And here's what's crazy about that market. Everyone in this room represents just a tiny fraction of the property management companies in the U.S. In fact, there are over 200,000 of them. 90% have fewer than five employees, and 75% are sole proprietorships. And what this means is that historically, this is an industry that's been really, really hard to scale. But that's all changing. The rise of smartphones means that everyone and not just property owners, but uh, you know, plumbers and electricians or tenants who might be on the lower end of the socioeconomic spectrum. Every one of these people is online all the time now. There's been a boom in real estate tech over the past few years, and that's made it possible to innovate in this industry without having to start from scratch. And as you guys all know, the economic conditions of the past 10 years have led to more and more people investing in real estate. Uh, there's just never been a better time to, to be in this business. And to me, this ties in with some broader trends that we've seen in the world of technology over the past couple of years. You know, there have really been three eras of the modern tech industry since it, it, it came about in about the 90s, right? So the first era, the first era was just about putting the basics online. You had web browsers, search engines, stores. We're talking like just the basic stuff people needed to first make use of the internet in their lives. The second era was about connecting people. Right, so big successes from this era were uh, communications tools like Skype or social networks like Facebook and LinkedIn. Now we're in the third era. The third era is about connecting people and things, right? It's about using the internet to connect us with every part of the physical world around us. And that's what companies like Uber and Airbnb are doing. Now, I talked before about how, you know, in this new world, companies that don't traditionally think of themselves as tech companies are going to have to, you know, start taking some of the tech industry knowledge uh, into account. But in fact, the opposite angle would be equally true. Uh, tech companies are going to have to start doing a lot of stuff that tech companies historically haven't done. They're going to have to roll their sleeves up and get their hands dirty. Um, and that's a lesson that we learned firsthand in the early days of Castle. You know, when we first started the company, we didn't really know what we wanted to do, right? The idea was kind of first germinating in our heads in late 2014. We were in this industry. We knew that we wanted to make life better for rental owners, but we didn't really know exactly how. Uh, and so we looked around at all these property management companies around us, and we saw a lot of them struggling with the software they used. And we thought to ourselves, okay, well, we'll just make software for these management companies. And that's like a classic tech person reaction, right? You see a problem, and you want to just kind of slap some software on top of it. But we quickly realized that that was sort of a you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink it approach, right? Uh, if we were going to really build uh, the experience we wanted, uh, we'd, we'd have to kind of control uh, the, the, the whole stack, right? The real opportunity here, it's not just about layering software on top of an existing business. It's about building new business models from the ground up that are only enabled by changes in technology. And besides, you know, if all we did was just sell to other management companies, we'd be really limiting our market. If we sell to management, we're never going to be bigger than the management companies we sell to. But the crazy thing about management right now is that in the U.S., 80% of landlords don't even use it. And most of these people, right, they're not not using property management because they just love managing their properties themselves. I'm sure there are a few people like that. Most of these people just haven't found the right solution. But honestly, uh, you know, as important as running those numbers is for making decisions for us, I think even more important is, frankly, just the emotional component. You know, we started this business because we wanted to help other rental owners, and it's much more satisfying to work with them directly than to just be a supplier for one of their intermediaries. Uh, but it's true. This approach means we have to deal with a lot of shit, right? Like, we can't just sit behind our screens writing code. We have to meet tenants and fix broken water heaters and take angry calls in the middle of the night, right? All the stuff that the people in this room, you guys are all familiar with, but that's all stuff that tech companies have historically been really allergic to doing. But that's starting to change, right? Think about Uber. Imagine if instead of actually building out their own taxi network in the physical world, 
imagine if Uber had just made an app and they tried to sell it to other cab companies, right? They wouldn't be anywhere near the success they are now. I'm not even sure they would have been able to get one cab company to, to use that app. Um, and, and, that, and that's kind of exactly the trend that we see ourselves as a part of. So how do we do it at Capital? Specialization, automation, and outsourcing. First, our software breaks property management down into its smallest discrete components so that our team can become highly specialized at what they do. Then we automate everything that a robot could do so that we reduce human error and increase our own efficiently. efficiency. Excuse me. Uh, and then most importantly, we outsource as much as possible to other tech services, to third-party companies, to independent contractors, to on-demand labor, uh, and to customer support reps in the Philippines so that our team can be laser focused on the things they do best. Now, I could stand up here showing you more screenshots of our technology or talking about how the whole system works or kind of diving into the structure of our operations team, but that's not how I want to use my remaining time on this stage. Um, and that's because as important as this technology and this stuff is to making Castle works, uh, the way we see it, this stuff isn't actually what makes Castle works. It's just the result of what makes Castle work. What really makes Castle work is our culture. Now, uh, the word culture is bandied about a lot in the business world these days, and uh, you know it usually just means like we have beer in the break room and we've got a ping pong table, and that's not what culture is. Uh, if you take a shitty job and you add a ping pong table, you get a shitty job that also has ping pong. Um, <laughs> we see culture a little bit differently. We see culture as having two main components. So first off, culture is a shared set of values. And culture is a framework for making decisions. And what that really means is that it's culture that allows a company to scale, right? Culture lets everyone at your company operate autonomously while the company as a whole still moves like one unified entity. And so at Castle, we have a company mission. And that mission is to make renting out a property as easy as buying a stock and renting a property as easy as booking a hotel. And this mission is really important to us, right? This is the North Star for everything we do, um, but it's also a major part of recruiting. Because if you want to have the best people on your side, you have to give them the chance to be a part of something bigger than themselves. And that's extra, you know, doubly, triply true in an industry like property management, which, you know, let's face it, this is not most, you know, recent college graduates' first uh, career choice. But, you know, as exciting as this mission as is to us, as, as jazzed up as we get about what we're doing, um, you know, it's not the, the most important part of uh, our jobs. Uh, personally, for me, the most rewarding part of my job, just like the most rewarding part of my life, is the people. You know, uh, my co-founders and I often joke that we started the company because, you know, in this millennium, that's what people like us do. You know, we wanted the chance to impact other people's lives on a massive scale. But if we had been born in the year 1100, we probably would have just started a religion. And so, and so Castle also has a cultural mission. And that cultural mission is to help everyone on the team achieve self-actualization and to perpetuate a radical life philosophy based on transparency, feedback, and continuous self-improvement. And I'd like to talk about each of those three in turn. So first, transparency. You know, one thing that I've uh, really noticed in the business world, and I was just talking uh, with Jordan about this backstage, uh, They have to be really secretive about everything they're doing because if, if they talk about it, well, then one of their competitors might find out, right? And if their competitors know what they're doing, then they might copy them. Um, we take the completely opposite approach. You can find me after the show, uh, after this <laughs> talk, excuse me. I have a theater background, so I'm used to saying after the show. Uh, you can find me after this talk, and uh, I will tell you every last detail about how Castle operates. Because... Most of the time, the reason your competitors don't copy you, it's not because they just can't see what you're doing, right? If you're successful in the market, people are going to see what you're doing. They can't copy you because they don't have the right culture, or they don't have the right internal incentive, or they just don't have the ability to put what you're doing into practice. And so for us, you know, transparency, it's not just about giving our customers uh, the data and information about what we're doing. It's not just about building connections in the industry. For us, transparency is about fostering trust and an emotional connection with our customers. And that's doubly true when we mess up. 
you know, one of the paradoxes of customer service is that admitting a mistake and making it right often makes your customers actually like you way more than if you had just never made the mistake in the first place. And for us, by building systems that don't even give us the chance to hide when we mess up, because that mistake might be transmitted to our customers in real time, that can cause pain in the short term, but it's actually good for us in the long term, because when we can't hide our mistakes, we're just forced to get better at what we do as fast as we possibly can. And a big part of how we do that is through feedback. One of the hallmarks of working at Castle is a pretty intense feedback process that takes place every six weeks. You know, most companies say they do feedback, but they don't really do what I'd call feedback. So for us, the hallmarks of feedback are that it starts and stops with your coworkers having a chance to share their feedback with you and with you having a chance to hear it. And that's it, right? We stress all the time that it's a totally valid response to feedback to hear someone's feedback, decide that it's not really right, and then just not act on it. But what we've noticed is that most of the time, most people don't do that. And honestly, from my own personal experience, if I hear feedback that really stings, and my instinct is to argue or to ignore it, you know, that's usually a good sign that there's a kernel of truth there. You know, at most companies, if feedback happens once or twice a year, right, that's not frequent enough to be useful. It doesn't let you get in that flow state where you're hearing feedback, improving, watching yourself get better bit by bit. If feedback is just your boss telling you to do something different, that's not really feedback, that's kind of an order. And if feedback is directly connected to your compensation, uh, then it's definitely not feedback. For us, you know, there's nothing more powerful than coming to work every day and knowing that everyone on your team is dedicated to helping you not just become a better person, excuse me, not just become better at your job, but uh, become a better person. And that leads to continuous self-improvement. You know, over the past 100 years, the average lifespan of corporations has trended only in one direction, and that direction is down. Uh, you know, today, uh, just staying at the level you are is never going to be good enough, right? Stagnation is a one-way ticket to death. And if you want to be constantly improving as a company, the best way to do that is just to help your people constantly improve. If a business is just a vehicle for enabling change in the world, then why not start with the people who work there? So at Castle, we have a saying that we use when we're hiring, and that saying is attitude over aptitude. And the basic idea behind that is that, you know, when we're hiring, we look for someone's approach to the job over everything else. Because if someone has the right attitude, then you can teach them anything. And if someone has the wrong attitude, then there's no amount of experience or skills that that's going to save them. And I think it's the same thing for a company. If you build your company around the right systems, the right culture, the right values, then it'll be able to adapt to do anything. And it's going to have to, because every successful company in their path to success has to tackle challenges that there's no way they could have anticipated when they started. And to me, that's really what every company being a tech company is about. It's not about building an app for your business. It's about recognizing the ethos and the values that have made the startup world so successful. An openness to change and an awareness that you're going to have to constantly improve. My name is Max Nussenbaum, my company is Castle, and I think I'm going to take some questions from all of you uh, with Jordan, so thank you so much.